morning, good morning. This is Straight Talk Morning Show, and this is Andre Hill and my co-host, Natasha Oliver. Good morning, Latasha. How are you today? Great morning. I am awesome. How are you doing? Uh, I'm great. Uh, it, you know, we are in the crosshairs of a serious hurricane. Yes. So this is the hurricane show this morning. The hurricane show. <laughs> All right. That's a different spin. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, you know, this is the show about, this is the straight talk show about economic empowerment and now that we have another metaphysical scientist in here, so it's metaphysical consciousness, <laughs> awakening, awareness, waking our people up and waking all humans up. But primarily right now, we are focusing on the black aboriginals because, you know, it's from my perspective, you know, we're the ones who are going to have to turn this planet around. We got to reverse it from greed uh, lies, death, and destructions to a planet of harmony. Harmony, yes. Yes. So, you know, I we were at Latasha's uh, um, uh, event last week, and man, I, we we got a chance to to, to be exposed to uh, working things out. You know, it could, because one of the things on this show we want to really focus on, and just like the Will of Lynch letter focused on our females so we want to really focus on reversing that damage because that's the most serious component of our community is our beautiful nubian black aboriginal women and um you know i've learned the things you know our women have been subjected to some serious psychological and detrimental uh punishment right you know and uh you know, we, we got to encourage, no, first, our black men to understand and appreciate that and start working on the healing process because we, we can't heal. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, I'm encouraging all women, you know, Natasha, explain, you know, the, the event, that, that, you know, in terms of where we, where we went. So, um, for those of you that knew, I had the event last week called The Secret to Living and Creating Your Best Life. And it was a vision board <clears throat> workshop, not a vision board party. Um, what we did was the first six hours, yeah, six hours, because we the workshop was a full eight-hour event. It was from nine to five. So, the first six hours, we actually did a lot of deep work. We did... Um, we went into limiting beliefs. We did some clearing. We did some healing. We did some guided meditations. Uh, we talked about forgiveness. We talked. We talked about a, <clears throat> a whole lot of a lot of things. We had some breakthroughs in there. Some healings going on. A lot of good feedback. So um, it was a great event. Great turnout. What did What did you think? I mean, you were a participant. So what, what What was your take on it? What did you take away from it? Well, my my take was. I mean, you. We were clearing the mind, mm -hmm. you know. Right. Uh, I think so many of us are walking around holding things in, and uh, <clears throat> so in order for us to move forward, we got to clear our mind. Right. And uh, I think the women that were there had chance to express some of the trials and tribulations that they had gone through. And we were working it out and, mm -hmm. you know, in different stages. And, and I think, Latasha, what you were doing is, you know, subscribing a series of, of issues or, or social or psychological technology to bring it out so that the person could just, you know, relieve that burden you know right. i think uh erica badu came up with a bag lady you know and, and, and so many sisters <laughs> yeah. are carrying all of these yeah. bags right and i think this was a exercise to help them to drop some of those bags yeah exactly some people don't even realize the baggage that they're actually carrying so in order to heal and move forward some some of us go through like some of the same repeated you know unhealthy patterns in our life and we don't know why we don't know how to identify that or heal from it to move forward so we can actually live the way we want to live and so what we were doing in the workshop is i was taking people to a place where bringing them to awareness of where they where they are and also showing them okay this is where you are but this is how you get to a better place you have to identify it first before you can heal it and some people don't even understand what it is they need to heal but they just keep going through the same motions over and over and over again so i was very happy with the fact that um a lot of the participants received healings and breakthroughs on that particular day um after we did the workshop portion of it which was the first six hours 
we did the last two hours of building um, vision boards. So everyone built a vision board and representing, you know, who they, what they wanted to be doing in, in life going forward. So it was a very, very powerful day for a lot of people that, that were there. So I'm very happy that the turnout was the way it was. Okay, so uh, we do have a, a special guest that we're uh, using uh, this advanced, techno advanced technology to cut them in and bring them in on the show, uh, Dr. Christopher Warren. And he has an extensive resume of community uh, involvement. He's a community activist and educator. Uh, so while we're working on bringing him up, uh, we want to talk about our sponsors. Uh, first and foremost, we had uh, Brother Michael on last week, and this is Best Deal Pharmacy, and uh, he's located at 5352 North Habana Avenue. So uh, Michael last, last week was on, and we, we talked about, you know, the different services and, and from pharmaceutical drugs and telemade drugs, you know, for those that are having special reactions, uh, or even, and, and for, for the animals that are having sickness. You know, when you bring animals in out of the wild into your home, they start developing sicknesses, and they know how to go find the cure. So if they can't go find it while they're in your uh, home, he knows how to prescribe uh, some certain treatments, alchemist, alchemist uh, treatments that that will keep your animals as well as yourself. So, give him a call at eight one three six four four six eight four five and uh, ask for Michael, and he will help assist you. Um, also. <laughs> before we before we get into uh, uh, Dr. Warren, uh, I posted on my Facebook page, you know, last night about, you know, this there, you know, gentrification is alive and well. You know, there is a well synchronized and orchestrated uh, agenda to drive in real estate prices through the roof, and one particular culture who has uh, the benefit of owning 90% of the land in the United States are the ones that are really working with uh, gentrification. And, you know, I'm going like, okay, so maybe at some point they, they will realize that, you know, they had a, a distinct advantage. And in a lot of cases, the black aboriginals did not get, you know, they got, some of them got 40 acres on a mule, but a lot of us have not had the chance to build the banks and the financial institutions to support the land that we acquired, so we end up losing it. And so now, I was, so this is what happened. And in, in order for me to expand on particularly where this happened and who it happened with, you, you got to call in. You got to give me some encouragement. So call in at 813 444 nine five eight eight because this young caucasian man in this particular neighborhood basically said gentrification is good and so i'm being a reporter i you know i was kind of laid back i was invited and so i didn't want to take over the meeting uh with my comrade or young the brother that i've known most of my life he was there and he did not react to uh you know this statement of gentrification is good so if this young Caucasian man said that, I want you to call in and, and explain to me what, what do you think he meant? Did he mean that gentrification is good because progress is good or gentrification is good because, uh, be, uh, because of, you know, we're, we're going to come in and run the real estate prices up and, and you black folks that don't own banks and businesses, if y'all don't submit, y'all going to have to move out of here and we're going to take over. So I, I did not follow up. I did not confront this young Caucasian man, and I may expand more on it. You call in and tell me what you think he meant when he said gentrification is good. So give us a call in at 813-444-9588 and tell me what you think, and I'll tell you where it, where it happened and the circumstances when you call in. So, Natasha, how are we coming with the... Uh, we are... I know people on Facebook are like, what is she doing? I, <laughs> I'm trying to to uh, bring our guest, Dr. Warren, on our live Facebook um, right now. So, technical stuff is going on, and we have our production team 
trying to to get him on. So that's what we're in the process of doing. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh, hold on. Okay. So while we get ready for that, I'm going to reflect back on some of the issues from last week. And, um, and we will have Dr. Warren on. You know, I, I was, you know, looking at the resume and, you know, one of the things I posted about uh, doc, uh, Dr. Warren is, you know, I have a metaphys- met- metaphysical perspective of how things need to be repaired. And my question, you know, to our, a lot of our brothers that, you know, subscribe to academia that was set up by the European design, you know, how sincere is the syllabus or the curriculum to really addressing issues uh, concerning our children in education. And also one of the key issues um, that he indicated was cultural foundation. So I have a ton of questions. We know Uh, you do. (laughs) We know you do. (laughs) Yeah, because, you know, to me, I, I look at this as a war and and I don't look at it as a war against one culture after you know versus another I look at this as a war between good and evil you know and good is just do right by people evil is I want to do it for myself my own personal gain or my own selfish insecurity that I have to en- enslave or suppress or oppress another culture in order to serve my purpose and so that's evil and so you know we are constantly confronted with uh this issue of of disparity between one culture and another culture and also the 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 culture of white supremacy and and don't get it twisted white supremacy is not just Caucasian or European people. There are a lot of people that subscribe to white supremacy. We have people in our own community that subscribe to white supremacy because white supremacy is designed to give only a few people in the community economic prosperity. And so what happens is that those chosen people buy into it and they say, oh, yeah, I got I got my N or I got my Ph.D. And, 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 you know, I'm living good off this system. And so I don't want it to change. I want suppression and, and uh, oppression to continue. And that's this is why we still have, you know, the, these problems and issues going on. So don't always think that white supremacy is about um, uh, Caucasian and European people, because we talk about the parasite. And the parasite is non-human, but it uses different cultures or individuals to do its bidding on this planet. So for those that are trying to think, well, what, what is this parasite Andre is talking about? Well, you know, for all my biblical people that read the Bible, uh, there was a story about uh, where the so-called Christ was in a, the desert. And this entity walked up to him and basically said, Hey, why don't you bow down and worship me? And the Christ res- ultimately responded, what is it for a man to gain the world and lose his soul? So that entity, I, I relabel it. You want Some people want to call it Satan, the devil. I call it a parasite because it, it lives, it attaches to us, to our mind and to our body, and it uses us uh, you know, in, in a very uh, horrible way to work against each other. And that's why we're having all these problems. That's why we got this hurricane bearing down on us right now because of that neg- negative energy going on. And um, so we have a break coming up. And stay tuned. Hopefully we'll have Dr. Uh, Warren on. Uh, and, and so I can start lightening up with, with all the questions. Um, all right. So for all of our um live people that are watching us on our facebook we have two facebook live streams going on right now one we are about to the one that was originated at the beginning we are actually going to cancel that so go to the new facebook live stream that we have (laughs) all right hello dr warren We did. (laughs) (laughs) 
All right. Okay, so, so uh, to our in-touch news people, we're going to go to break, but we're still live on Facebook here. Been in a car crash? Call Ricky. Don't know what to do? Ask Ricky. We will connect you with a lawyer and doctor experience in auto accident injuries. Call Ricky at 844-361-7425. After an auto accident, you have 14 days to seek medical attention. You may be in pain. So call Ricky, ask Ricky for your best options. 844-361-7425. Call Ricky, ask Ricky is a legal and medical referral service. The lawyers in our network pay to receive referrals. Hi, I'm Donald L. Dowridge Jr., your motivational guru. This is the DLD Motivational Moment. You got up this morning. No, you got up this morning. Eyes sneaking open as the feet hit the floor. Got to thank God for the rise this day. The stove perking the smell of nutrition. Get to your destination with planned unselfish acts. Bulletin board read, do you have any to spare? Happiness and understanding. We all have experienced that one phone call. Family member, co-worker, friend has passed on. We don't know our last evening or morning. Get up. Help someone out. Now walk it out. You got up this morning. This has been the DLD Motivational Moment. You can reach out to DLD at DLD28-2002 at yahoo.com or 813-394-5875. Okay, so we're back, and we do have uh, uh, Dr. Carl Warren on. Oh, Chris, <laughs> I'm thinking about, you know what? <laughs> we, we have another uh, doctor. Warren doc- is my cousin. You know, I called him a doctor. He would smack you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. He said, that's, that's my cousin. That's, that's my a, cousin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, go ahead, Latasha. Introduce. Uh, definitely, definitely. So I want to introduce to you everyone um dr christopher warren and he is the founder and ceo of this nonprofit entity called spring zone of saint pete which focuses on youth and family development programs and he's also currently running the grant funded program um brunch of brothers which is a mental health um, initiation for black men and boys in the saint pete community so definitely want to welcome you i know that uh, one of the things that I really want to highlight is the fact that you go out into the community community and you talk to people about what their needs are and you actually help them by going out to to other nonprofit organizations or corporations and finding the help that they actually need. That's one of the things that I, I really like about what you're doing in, in the community. So I definitely want to welcome you to the show. And I want to know, like, what what is it that inspired you to start start doing that in the community? Uh, well, for one, thank you for inviting me on this morning. I'm always honored to have an opportunity to uh, operate with shows like this that kind of come from a community perspective. Um, so whenever you, know, you have a show like this, this means that people in the community are saying, hey, this is somebody we want to hear from. This is something we want to know more about. Um, so that's, that's always a plus in my book. Um, but the lion's share of my work comes from my experiences um, in graduate school thereafter in working in the social service industry. Mm-hmm. And what I found was because there's such a great divide between communities and corporations or entities with large sums of money that when it comes time to deliver services, much of the time there's a disconnect between what the people are saying that they actually want and need mm-hmm. and what grant funding cycles are offering money for. All right. There's such a distance between the two. Like, let's say, for instance, there's a food insecurity issue. People are saying, this, this is a food desert that I live in, Doc. Because uh, this is one of the issues I face. I was working at USF on a grant-funded program for African-Americans uh, to help them develop co-parenting skills. Uh, if they weren't going to be married, they still needed to learn how to work together in order to raise the child effectively. Right. And what I was finding from, you know, my experiences when the parents come in for interviews is there would be such a fluctuation in the energy that, that it was hard to get a, a solid read on 
what was a parenting or relationship issue and what was just a dealing with the, the symptoms of poverty issue. And, you know, in, in that study, I had over 200 moms and I took a sample group of them and just started asking them, because uh, I did have a background as a personal trainer when I was in college back in the good old days. Uh-oh, um, I got the background too. And <laughs> Right, and I was finding out these mamas were hungry because I have that issue myself. I, I'm a hangry person. Uh, if I start getting a little short, uh, a little cross with my answers, or a little impatient, nine times out of ten, I haven't eaten in over four hours. Right, so we were having these moms come in, and you know, we're talking to them and the child's father, and sometimes the moms are just they're not with it. They're just you know, I don't want to deal with him. I don't want to mm-hmm. look at him. Right. I don't care about him being. I don't care him being. Around. And then that same mom the next week would be like, oh, I love that he's here, he's doing this, he's doing that. And so I'm trying to figure out, uh, for fidelity purposes of the study, um, why are we getting these fluctuations in responses? So I, I talked to some of the dads. It's like, I said, what did she eat today before she came in, man? Um, <laughs> he'll go, man, she had some hot Cheetos and a, and a, and a Sprite, man. And I said, that was all she had. He said, yeah. And I'm like, okay. And I talked to another one. What she had before she came in? Oh, she had some McDonald's, man. She had a Big Mac. Surprise, da da da, da. And I'm like, okay. So I started, I made it formal. I went to my boss and I said, hey, look, I want to do a small informal survey. Not that we have to document, but I just want to get a sample of what these moms are eating before they come. And I did that and I found that all, almost all of these moms were eating terribly. Eating terribly, terribly, terribly. Extreme high amounts of, of hot foods, hot Takis, hot Cheetos, hot Doritos hot this, hot that, large amounts of, of carbonated drinks, lots of soda, uh, lots of Kool-Aid, lots of Hawaiian punch. And I said, okay, I need to be able to not just provide this program in terms of the relationship value between the mother and the father, but while we have all, while we have 200 families here uh, directly under our care, coming in voluntarily, provide them with a way to remedy one of the symptoms of their poverty, something that's going to affect their child, you know, what a mother eats, the child eats. And so I went and I got a supplemental grant from Don Secours, and I said, hey, look, these moms we're working with living in food deserts. It's a, uh, the county, I use the county, the, they were coming from a designated CRA area, a community redevelopment area, so I was like, all right, this has already been identified by the county as a food desert. Mm-hmm. We wouldn't be moms and provide healthier outcomes for the moms and the baby. And they said, absolutely. So I got a supplemental grant. I was able to provide healthy food options for all the moms. So when they came into those meetings, I was getting them uh, Trader Joe's. Um, uh, what's the other health food place? I'm sorry, it's, it's losing my mind. It's slipping my mind right now. Uh, but the, the Whole Foods type of uh, re- store that we have on 4th Street in St. Pete, I was able to go to restaurants and go, hey, I need some. I want to look at your menu. And I want to take some about four things that I want to be able to call you and say, I had need these and I need them delivered to you as well. Mm-hmm. Right? So like different chicken salads, different vegetarian options. And I noticed that after three months, the results we were looking for as far as the actual intervention were where we wanted them to be. Yep. But at the same time, I was able to take care of something that they needed. And that's kind of the, the foundation of Spring Zone. It's like you can offer people talk to them and, and, and operate from a human level and find out what they really need for themselves. I'm not telling you what you need. I'm going to talk to you and ascertain from what you tell me you need for your own personal health, your family's health, your community's health. And, and that's the foundation that I operate off of and try to act as a um, uh, stand in the gap. Mm-hmm. You know, because say, like I was saying before, the, the, the food insecurity, by the time the community says something, They've got to make enough noise so that it gets to leadership. And then leadership starts to talk about it, and it be, you know, when they bring in the county leaders and the city leaders, the elected officials, and the elected officials, you know, make it an issue. They make a pronouncement. All of a sudden, the grant institutions, they're like, okay, that's something we're going to focus on for the next cycle, right? Because that's how things go. So that next cycle comes in a year or two years, and now mm-hmm. this problem that we told you about is now two years old, but we're just now getting money for it. So we got the money for it, and we're all gung-ho. We want to deliver these services. But now, you're like, yeah, I was hungry, but now it's even more important because my son is feeling 
cars. Yeah. My nephew is getting arrested, so they have a whole other issue. Yeah. And it takes so much time for the money to get to the issue. And the way that poverty works is um, it's not necessarily an issue. It's the compounding of several issues. Yes. You know, over and over, over time, that just break families down and, and inhibit their progress and their ability to grow out of poverty. So I said, well, let me see if I can stand in the middle, if I can stand in the gap and get these funds because I'm in the community and I'm also, uh, you know, because of education, because of uh, politics, because of engagement, I'm able to walk into a lot of these places and to the CEO or the COO or the director and say, hey, um, I'm in the street and this is this is a huge issue that people are facing. And we don't have two years to wait for money to come down um, I need to be able to do something now. So I, you know, develop grant writing skills and said, okay, I may not be able to pull in $2 million, but I can get $200,000 and I can go in this community mm-hmm. and I can get them 80 to 85% of that grant directly applied to the services because I only hire people per project and I contract them out. Um, like I need you specifically for this. And so I'm able to hire and pay people from the community to help that community instead of bringing in, you know, other college students or people from other communities. I can pay people in that community to help that community overcome their issues that they specifically told me they wanted to overcome. Oh, I love it. I like the fact that um, you not only just you're you're listening to what the problem is, you're 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 able to identify, okay, first we need to fix this like you said, you know, what, what are people eating that's ca- that's actually causing their reaction and, and their behavior? A lot of people don't understand that, right. right? And as my background, I know that too, that, you know, what you eat directly affects how you feel and what you do, right? So I love the fact that you took that and you didn't just say, okay, let's talk about what's going on in, 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 in this relationship, in this family. You were like, wait a minute. First of all, let's fix this first because this could actually help with the relationship in the family. So I love the fact that you dug deep and you looked at the core issue and not just did the whole talking around, you know, okay, well, what, did, what, are, we, what are we arguing about? You know, those type of things. So I love that. Right, right. I absolutely love that. And I love the fact that you're, you're taking – um, your expertise and you're going out into the community and you're going to the corporation, you're talking to the CEOs, you're talking to the people that have the money and saying, we need to fix this now. We don't have time. Like you said, we don't have two years to wait for this whole process to take place. Like, what can we do right now to fix this? All right. So we, we're about to go to break. But on, when we come back, uh, uh, Christopher, I, you know, my question is, the, the root of this problem and I hear what you're saying going to corporate America uh, you know but corporate Amer- corporate America is getting in a state of mind of, yeah y'all need to fix your own problem as a people so how how are you how are you looking at partnering with other uh, civil rights or social activist groups to to develop an economic plan uh, to to resurrect our our neighborhood. So I'm, I'm, we're going to pose that question to you, and uh, we got a break coming up, and we're going to be right back uh, on the mainstream, but on the Facebook, you know, we can <laughs> elaborate a little bit. That's right. Uh-huh. <laughs> Hey, this is Agent Wright, better known as Mr. Clean. You looking for some great barbecues? Come see them two brothers in the grill. Located at 423 Virginia Street, Charleston, West Virginia. We got ribs, chicken, pulled pork, brisket, collard greens, mac and cheese, baby. Come get some. And get you a nice, smooth cigar. 304-550-4431. That is 304-550-4431. Come get some, baby. The rib man, mama, the rib man. My name is Gil Sampson. I didn't come from a very rich family, and so paying for college would have been very tough. I don't know if I would have been able to go to the college that I went to, and then I don't know if I would have gotten into the career that I am in. So I think Bright Futures has done a lot to shape my life. I got a job as a structural engineer, and I design residential buildings, commercial buildings all over the United States. Because of Bright Futures, I was able to go to college 
you know, so many kids just don't even ever get that opportunity. And to be able to do it and not have any debt when I graduated is amazing. And it was all thanks to Bright Futures. Florida has created more than one million jobs in only five years, and a great education connects our students to these exciting opportunities. That's why the Florida Lottery has funded Bright Futures Scholarships to help over 725,000 students attend college. Because every play is for education. The Florida Lottery. Just imagine. When it comes to reality radio, everyone is a star. Shining star for you to see what your life can truly be. On your smooth soul and R&B station. On the World Wide Web. In Touch Radio. This is Straight Talk Morning Show, and we have Dr. Christopher Warren, Warren on. And the last question I ask, I mean, he has a brilliant plan of approaching corporate America and saying, we got a problem in our neighborhood. And, uh, you, you know, I've noticed a lot of sisters, man, uh, you can see that their diet is not in, a, in, mm-hmm. in a, the, the right type of diet. You can tell by the obesity. You can look at their skin, right. you know, and, and it's, it's, it's a serious problem. But my, my question uh, to Christopher is basically, you know, we have gone, you know, you know, we're still going back to corporate America saying, please, will y'all ha- give us a handout? And corporate America knows these things are going on, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and if they intended for us to resolve these issues, they would have invested into us, our, our communities a long time ago. My, my biggest concern is we have, how do we approach the five percent in the black community who's sitting on on the, the so-called token wealth uh, to to now reinvest to start eliminating these uh, food deserts in our community and coming up with an economic plan because um, the, uh, uh, the I, you know what stuck in my head was uh, Carl Anderson and you know uh, uh, you look at. Uh, the different cultures, how they look after each other, Mm -hmm. you know, and so I I had, I put the question to you, are you working with community activists uh, or and and economists to get together to, how do we redevelop trust in our own community, Uh, how do we build economic empowerment in our own community so that we can start teaching our people how to eat, you know, Mm -hmm. now I heard you say you, you came to Florida when you were six years old, and I, I, you know, I was born here a long time ago, and my mother was a food nutritionist. Mm-hmm. When we were in elementary and high school, we ate very well balanced meals, mm-hmm. and we were taught how to eat. You know, right. and so all of that has dissipated, and yeah. corporate America had to be involved in that. You know, because mm-hmm. the, you know, well, the other kids, you know, just because the kids are saying, "I'm I'm spoiled, I don't want to eat a nice ba- balanced yeah. meal." Well, you know, when we were coming up, you're going to eat what they gave you. Right. And if you're hungry, you're going to eat. <laughs> so, I, you know, I, that's 10 questions in one. I, you know, you know, uh, Christopher, so go hey, ahead. I hope you kept up, Chris. Okay. I don't... <laughs> okay, okay, first of all, you have, you have to understand. You have to understand. That's not a problem. Uh, I'm also a college professor by trade. And I'm used to getting students who haven't formulated their thoughts. So they give me everything. A whole life story. <laughs> and I go, hey, what should we do about this? <laughs> I'm all right with untangling um, but so I, I think I'll, I'll start it from this direction. I I work with whoever is passionate about what I'm passionate about. Um, one of the great failures of my life that I'm glad happened was that passion. Um, at the beginning, thinking this very uh, pro-black unifying idea that black people want to black people. Very, 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 matter of fact, the worst human experience I've ever had um, in trying to work with the community in India, and I was hoping they were getting a group of people together, led to was wrong. Uh, um, I've been taking advantage of not just my name, but my position and doing things in my name um, to, to boost his, uh, his own situation and kind of settle my leg rather than his mind. So, that put me in the mind frame of, okay, look, uh, said, uh, a lot of this stuff Sounds good, but we really are damaged people, and capitalism has made it so we don't look out for the community. We look out for ourselves, putting money in our own pockets, and that is the antithesis of what I do. What I do is 
get people to put themselves in a position to help themselves. Like I said, I find people in the community and then give them the money and let them do the work. Uh, I'll guide it. I'll write the grant. I'll do the data. You know, I use my privilege as somebody with a PhD to provide that level of, of um, assessment. Like I'll, you know, track the grades of the kids, um, track the disciplinary issues, go to court with them. Like I, I'll do those things so that we can have good data to show what worthwhile um, but I do not do direct engagement in trying to bring tons of people together to convene and get them to solve a problem that's not my strength uh, I tried it because I believe in it uh, at my core I'm a pan-Africanist a, a Garvey a Garvey pan-Africanist not any of this newfangled stuff I firmly believe in self-determination Kuji Chakalia is the core it's the core of my philosophy in terms of community service. Um, so when, even when it comes to engaging corporations, if I see there's a corporation that's doing bad things in the neighborhood, I'm not going to approach them because I know they're looking for someone to validate what they're doing so that they can come back on the other end and go, okay, yeah, we, we blame for doing all these things, but we gave about 25 cents to help this. Mm -hmm. No, I find, what, what I find is there's a lot of corporations and a lot of white folks who want to help and have no idea how to. Because we have, unfortunately, a gatekeeper system in many of our communities. And they know that there's this person who they've always gone to who's black. But they notice that they give them opportunities and resources and it doesn't execute. It doesn't get implemented in the way that they thought it would. So I go to those folks and go, hey, look, this is exactly what I'm going to do. This is exactly who I'm going to use to do it. And this is how much money I need to do it. Because I often need substantially far less money excuse me than what other people are asking they're very intrigued because I tell people it doesn't take a million dollars to solve people all these problems that really doesn't if you give me two hundred thousand dollars I will double the value of somebody that somebody some other big group that you gave a million dollars to why because they have to pay more their bill they pay health insurance for all these other folks the executive director decided to pay themselves a hundred thousand dollars which is you know a ludicrous I'm only going to take but they tell me, if they say, hey, it's going to take us $150,000 to execute these services. I'll say, okay, I'll, I'll take what you, what you have left. Okay? I don't try to get rich off of assisting my community. I have quantity and quality. So as long as I continue to work hard, I get paid. <laughs> you, know, that's how, you know, that's how it works. Uh, whereas you have a the, the opposing philosophy which is i'm gonna find this issue i'm gonna get as much money as i can and when the grant comes in i'm gonna take half of it and if there's, and if there's enough left of services i'll go ahead and put it in that's the opposite uh and as far as activists i work with i work with activists as the issue as the issue dictates uh for example just two weeks ago uh i took 10 boys 10 african-american boys that they would label at risk or whatever i just called them black boys from they just, they just, they just kids that need to see more. Mm -hmm. uh, the Dream Defenders, who are the largest uh, social activist group in Florida that's currently active, that is based with people of color uh, and people under the age of forty. So these are young, young people of color who are pushing a specific uh, political agenda. They were very successful last year. They got Amendment Four passed, which restored voting rights for felons in Florida. Huge. And a lot of folks don't know that was 100% the effort of black and brown young people mm. uh, with the Dream Defenders. So they had their annual campaigning uh, in Fruitland a few weeks ago. And I took 10 boys from St. Pete down there, and they learned from their own kind. They learned from people who look like them that just because you're not 18, just because you're not wealthy, doesn't mean you can't positively and with a, and with a huge huge impact be able to make a paradigm shift right. uh, in, in your state, in your city, in your county. So I worked with that group as amazing people, Epiphany Summers, Ashley Green. Um, they're, they're some powerful state people, and they're right there in St. Pete. So, you know, instead of trying to call in somebody and march in and doing these things, you just find the people who say, like, look, I want these young people to get a political education, a real political education, you know, about disruption been following up with lobby uh, senators, not with money, but with getting them to sit down, come walk through my community, listen to me speak, 
see what my problems are. You know, true, authentic, grassroots community engagement and political activism. Um, that's a part of it. And I also give young people an opportunity to, to learn from black capitalists. Okay? Uh, you put these folks in front of some of these, you know, the 5% you were talking about, these very wealthy African Americans who are here. Like, people don't know um, that's a black owned firm who poured the concrete for the Howard Franklin Bridge. All right? And that brother, his son now runs that company. And he's worth millions and millions of dollars, but he's not out there at nightclubs. He's not out there with chains on. He's, he's a very low key brother because he was raised humbly with a man who worked with his hands in construction and concrete. When you get to the point where you pour concrete for a bridge that's 10 miles long, mm. you're talking big time. And these kids need to understand you don't have to go to college for that. That's a vocation. Right. 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 I'm on the side of W.E.B. Du Bois uh, as, as well as you know the vocational side. So, some kids are built for university learning. They're, they're, they're meant for yep. student uh, analysis examination and other others of us are absolutely gifted with our hands we're gifted you know some these brothers you know where did where did garrett morris well we have air conditioning now because the brother was gifted with his hands and wiring right we live in florida if it wasn't for a black man we'd all be hot right now <laughs> um, so i deal with i deal with corporations and, and businesses as the need presents itself you know, I, don't, I don't make any superficial alliances. I don't go begging people for money. I say, hey, look, this is what I'm doing. Yep. And yep. most often, as was the case with Brunch of Brothers, I pay for it out of my own pocket first. I put, I show that the proof is in the pudding myself, and a lot of people are willing to do that. They have an idea, and they want somebody else to pay for it. No, I believe so much in what I'm doing. I'll pay for it, and mm-hmm. I'm going to bring you the results. I'm going to bring you the data. I'm going to bring you the people. So we stand behind this guy. He's, it's, it's real. And then they cut the check. And when they cut the check, we get the work done. And I come back and I give them evidence that it works. And that's and that's the thing that's missing. We want to talk about corporations won't help. Corporations won't invest. But we need to address the fact that a lot of us, a lot of us, have been engaged in, in inauthentic behaviors. The fact that our children and families are suffering to better our own personal circumstances. Corporations have noticed it. I talked to the guy. I talked to a guy at Walmart, and we had a long conversation about that. He's done. He's paid so many college trips and all these things. He's like, they don't need to see me back pictures. Of the okay, like, so we ten thousand dollars, and you know, and I mean, that's so. I mean, you have to look at corporate engagement. Like they want to see some things with their money as well, and that means yeah. you actually have to do work. All right, we go out. All right, we're going to break, and and while we're on the break, I want to lay something on you. I, I want to get clarity on critical education and cultural foundations, and also, you know, I'm I'm proposing that we adopt a name. We've been called several different names throughout history, but we're proposing Black Aboriginals. You know, because you know the name white supremacy, it has a national or international. Uh, 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 flavor or, or meaning to it in an agenda, and so I'm thinking black. At, we 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 put this out there, and I, I meditated with the guardians and the ancestors, and they said call, we shouldn't be called Jamaicans, Bahamians, or Nigerians, or uh, African Americans. Why don't we just be black Aboriginals, the original human on this planet, and galvanize ourselves as a people? So think about that. Well, you know, while we go into break, and we're, we're going to ask you some questions. And uh, I want your response on it. You, this will be the first time that we put that, that name out there to, for a challenge. <laughs> okay. This is Dale Day. Join me every Monday at 7 p.m. for Jazz at Miss Connie's House. Bringing you the smoothest jazz and the coolest guests. Right here on In Touch Radio. Hi, I'm Donald L. Dowers Jr., your motivational guru. This is the DLD Motivational Moment. 
one darn second. America since 2017 is suffering from a serious hiccup. 9-11 is seriously overused in a distasteful manner. Every day the cops are calling on an innocent, innocent person of color. It amazes me that America has come down to this. A person of color becomes a person of interest. Waffle House, the dorm, Starbucks is a few. This is not the lunch counters, sit-ins of the 1960s. 2019 harassed Tiffany for being black and proud. Hold on one darn second. This has been the DLD Motivational Moment. Pre-order my new book, Motivational Moments, at DLD28-2002 at yahoo.com or 813-394-5875. In Touch Radio, where you can listen to a cruising flow of smooth soul and jazz. Today's R&B, a fun touch of hip-hop and gospel. All my music on one station. Giving you a buffet of music, news, and entertainment. We're In Touch Radio. So, so okay, so we, we, we've been on the line. If, if you on Facebook Live, we, we're carrying on conversations. And, uh, you know, I asked Dr. Warren, you know, basically about the name Black Aboriginals. And, and I'm, I'm, my question about critical education and cultural foundation, uh, I, I wanted to get some clarity in terms of, you know, the, those flags that he follow, uh, flies under. Not a problem. I get I get it a lot because what I was looking for you have to understand I, I wasn't shooting for a PhD um, I was at Florida a and University that's where I received my bachelor's and master's degree I had a master's in political science um, like you have to understand I was very much on the road to uh, the political life mm. my freshman year uh, dorm mate was Andrew Gillum uh, with Samson mm. Hall and uh, we were together at the same time, and we led the marches um, along with uh, President at the time, Derek Heck, who's also a major figure in urban education right now. Um, the city ends of Jeb Bush's office when they were trying to consolidate Florida State and University of Florida State. Um, it was my intention um, uh, to follow up on that baptism of fire of, of reality uh, at that time. I, I was like, at no point in my life uh, will any African American institution of higher education emerged uh, due to capital interest. Uh, so I was very much on that track. I was uh, working for the Florida Legislative Black Caucus under uh, Al Lawson, and that was that was my direction. That was definitely my direction. I had much more hair up here, no hair on my face. <laughs> uh, you wouldn't believe this. Me. What's up, Uncle Bob? Oh, Uncle Bob just joined. That's what's up. Uh, <laughs> Uncle Bob, hey. hey. <laughs> so um, they, Florida a and has something they call the feeder and a good friend of mine who graduated from FAMU named Kevin Brooks, who's now Dr. Kevin Brooks, he had gone to Purdue. And he came back representing Purdue at the theater. And he said, Chris, you need to come on and get this PhD. And I said, brother, I'm not trying to be in school another five years. He said, well, you know, I need to recruit. I need to show that, you know, to justify us coming here, I got to show that some black folks are interested. So will you at least come to the visit? And I said, all right. So they flew me up uh, to Purdue showed me all 12 of the black people on campus <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no academically it, I was challenged uh, I met some folks and because at this time man, I was super duper sharp all I cared about was reading and reading and reading and you know I was you know there were some folks who were challenging and they said well you know what we have fellowships for people like you it sounds like you already know where you're going you've already got your research and, uh, and I said, yeah, but you guys currently don't have a system that will allow me to do my research the way I want to because mm -hmm. I, I believe in interdisciplinary research. No answers will be found in history. No answers will be found in sociology. No answers will be found in political science. You need all of those things in order to untangle the African experience and any remedies that you're going to come up with to try to address it. All right? First, you need to know the history. You need to know the sociological circumstances, uh, the, the housing, the how's it got the 1960s the effect of developing suburbs uh, in Levittown, Long Island, what that did to help create redlining and blockbusting. And, uh, you have to, so you have to, and police brutality. And, oh, you have to understand the sociological aspects. You have to understand the political aspects, what certain laws did to it, things that seem to you know, look good on the surface, but actually 
tore apart the black family. So you need all of arts and sciences, social sciences, to be able to, to put forth an adequate remedy for issues for African Americans. And um, that's when, at the time, um, Dr. Bill Mullen came to me. He says, well, we have an interdisciplinary program here. It's called American Studies. And, so, you know, just based on myself, I was like, American Studies? <laughs> You know, he said, no, 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 it's, it's called American Studies because you take any issue in America, you can focus on any issue in America <laughs> in interdisciplinary studies to address it in research. And I said, okay, okay, okay. I said, most of what I was doing was in, I, I found education. Uh, I'm a firm believer that it was the development of the education system, um, the kill the savage and save the man, which was the foundation for. Indian acculturation schools was actually the foundation of public schools in Georgia, the first public school system. And that's been the philosophy of public school and how they treated African American children. Say, kill the savage, kill the blackness, and save the man. You know, this kind of quote unquote Uncle Tom or sellout mentality. It's, it's, it's put inside of you at the onset of public education. The ones that that seed blossoms in will make it, the ones that don't, they fall off, they don't mm -hmm. graduate. That nature. So I said, look, I want education to be the crux, and I want to show how all of these things revolve around education, the access to it, the curriculum development, all of those things. And I said, okay, so what you're doing is you're looking at educational studies and the cultural foundations of it, the, the purely uh, ethnic minority and American cultural foundations of public education and public education analysis. And so that was my main vein of study. And Purdue, as most of you know, is in Indiana. It's 90 minutes from Chicago. So I did all of my research. Not all. I did a lion's share of my research in Chicago. Uh, I did my dissertation research on African African centered schools, public schools. So I would go to different communities. I went to Chicago, uh, the Chicago public school system, Kansas City, Missouri public school system, the Tallahassee public school system, and then in my own hometown, which did not have an African centered school. And I used that to show come from the projects. There were kids in Inglewood, Cal uh, Inglewood, Chicago that didn't have windows on their houses. Whole neighborhoods oh, wow. don't have windows on the houses. All right? They got boards and stuff, and it's negative 15, negative 20 outside. Mm. And there were kids from that neighborhood. Some went to Chicago public schools, and others went to African center schools like Barbara Sizemore, the Hockey Matabuchi schools. And those kids from those neighborhoods who went to the African center schools performed exceptionally well on standardized tests and their own cultural curriculum, while their classmates who went to Chicago public schools uh, were often killed, uh, dropped out by the eighth grade, extremely poor school performance, their school experience marred by violence, and so on and so forth. So that proved to me I knew what I was talking about. <laughs> okay, so, so like, okay, all, right, all right, so that's we, the, we, that's, we... That's the crux. So we, cultural <laughs> foundation, critical education is the analysis of education, the foundations of, uh, of education from a cultural perspective, not just an educational one. So that gives us the ability to look at what's happening outside of school and say those things are just as important as what's happening inside school. Okay, so we're winding down to about three minutes, uh, and, and and so oh, I got wow. I got two questions still still that if if that name that I want you to take on that, and also do you believe the Willie Lynch letter was uh, how to make a slave is real? Well, before we get into, well, before we get into that, because we got a couple of minutes, let's 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 Dr. Warren. Before we get into that, let's get your contact information for people out there. Um, before you answer that question, that way people know how to get in contact with yes. you, um, for sure, because yes. you're a valuable at, resource out there. Listen, I'm at listen, learn, and teach. Listen, learn, and teach. Dot com. Uh, my Gmail is springzone saint p at gmail. And that's spelled exact phonetically exactly as sounds springzone saint p at gmail.com. The website is listen, learn, and teach. It's all spelled out together. The case doesn't matter. Dot com. Um, but for his question, I'm glad he asked because I love it's, it's a, it's a two-pronged answer that's still fast. Historically, because I am a historian, we know Willie Lynch was not an actual person. Okay? There is no evidence of a Willie Lynch as a slave owner, uh, any documentation that this person ever existed. However, <laughs> however, the methods on how to break a slave are absolutely factual. We do have documentation, uh, shared correspondence between slave owners 
um, not just from the United States, but from the, uh, the British West Indies as they were at that time, uh, the United Kingdom, Brazil, and the United States that all collectively acknowledge the use of each and every one of those items within that book. Absolutely. So what, what I'm thinking, uh, my, my hypothesis is there was a John Brown type of white figure who knew all of these things and decided to put that together to illustrate, or a very prominent West Indian black scholar, because a lot of the, the lion's share of the, of the powerful uh, slave era research was done by black men in the West Indies. Uh, whether you, you know, you, oh gosh, everybody's name is leaving me right now. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, France Fanon and well, we, uh, J.A. We, we're uh, going to have to bring you know, back on. That's the same, but everybody right now. But, but those things absolutely happen, and they're still in effect today. Uh, the young versus the old. Uh, the young black men Absolutely. don't like to talk to old mm-hmm. black men because old black men look down on them and chastise them and only want to yell at them. The light skin versus the dark skin. Uh, you know, all of the, the male versus the female we see now is at its highest and most toxic level. I never thought that that would be one that would actually you know, come to fruition. But if you look at it, uh, the male, the black male versus the black female is at, at its all time worst. Mm-hmm. Um, so yes, all of those methods, anybody who tries to tell you that they're not valid okay. is somebody who is uneducated or is a willing participant in trying to separate us uh, as a people. Awesome. So, okay. So we are definitely at our time for today. And we are going to have you back on the show, Dr. Warren. Cause <laughs> yeah, you got to ask some other question, man. We, are, you, we the, the black aboriginal uh, galvanizing force. That's that's the next topic. We, gonna, we, we might have to bring you back on. So you're going to make me go out of, it's so funny, man. Like people who are just joining going to sit here and think I was just sitting here being an angry black man. No. <laughs> At the end, to try to dig out my black activist stuff. Um, uh, for other people watching, I'm a very calm, safe, happy brother. Because yes, he is. He is. He is. He is. Uh, Doing a lot of positive honesty, things in the community. I believe that because of who we are, diversity of the African diaspora, I believe that people who are descended from Africa are 100% allowed to self-identify as whatever they want. If you want to be an Afro-American, you deserve to be that. That's right. If you want to be black, you can be that. If you want to be African, you want to be, you can be all of those things. Just, it's, it's more important to me that you understand you are a descendant of African the, All a, right, the, I love it. That's, and that's exactly how we're going to end the show. You, you can call yourself Jigaboo no. James. I don't care. What, what you call this has been you Straight you Talk right Morning right. Show. <laughs> Join us we'll next week. On. We're going we're gonna to pr- bring him back on. And, 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 and definitely, on. we want to get him in the studio so we can go eye to eye on some of this stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so y'all. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Be safe with the hurricane. Thank you. So those of you on Facebook.